So today we're going to walk through various tools and reporting dashboards in Facebook, Twitter, and Google Analytics. We're going to look at Facebook Insights and what we can see about our existing audience and why it's important to actually export that data. I will show you a tool that uses the Twitter API, which is really helpful for finding influencers and doing outreach efforts. And then we'll conclude with a look at how you can be more efficient with Google Analytics by setting up custom alerts, dashboards, and reports. So if you attended Tuesday's webinar on Master Facebook Marketing, we talked briefly about insights. And I said I, we'd look today more at graph search. Um, and how to use those features for audience research. So we'll look at that, um, but as a reminder, the, the number one thing that most pages get wrong is um, the timing of their post. So as a reminder, you find when your fans are online under the post tab. People often think it should be under the people tab, um, but it's actually under the post tab. And then the other tab um, where you find demographic information is the people tab. So that's going to give you the age and gender and location of your existing fans. So uh, let's get started. We'll have a look at that graph search, at insights, and um, some of these other reports. So as a reminder, um, when you're looking at insights, you've got this post tab. You can hover over each of the days of the week. That's going to show you how um, the time that your fans are online are different for each day. You can start thinking about when to schedule your post based on when people are online. We also have this section at the bottom that shows us a rundown of what kind of engagement or reach each post had. And um, most people don't know, you can click any of these columns to sort. It takes a really long time, so I'm not going to, to do that in the webinar. But just as a note for yourself, if it is taking a long time and you don't see anything happening, rest assured it's just Facebook and the little gears running in the background. Um, other things you can do kind of in this web interface, you can force that engagement column to show you a breakdown of likes, comments, and shares or you can pull it all together into um, a single engagement rate. Um, but as I mentioned, this sort of, the, all the data in this web interface isn't as helpful as what you can see through this export function. So we'll look at that in a second. Um, right now, let's just uh, talk about graph search. So in general, you can basically see any type of information um, that you want using the search. So it's going to give you some little highlights. Maybe I want to see what um, interests people have who live in Ontario who are um, 25 to 34, or what kind of book pages do people with those characteristics have. Um, we can also see things like people who like um, any particular page on Facebook. So maybe I want to see um, my friends over at Orca Books, what kind of people like their page. I can start building out some idea of an audience profile or personas based on research of my own page or other people's pages. Even just scrolling down and looking at the avatars gives me an idea of, you know, it looks like mostly women of certain certain age, there tends to be a lot of dogs in these images. So maybe they're also dog lovers. Um, I can look at the type of uh, where they study, what other pages they look at. And then there's a filter here, which is going to let me, you know, sort by gender, relationship, maybe uh, type of employment, um, things like the city they live in. Um, their employer, but I can do all of that through some advanced searches as well. I can say, show me um, the pages liked by people who like Orca books um, and Anik Press, right? Maybe I want to create a little Venn diagram of, of information, or I can say interests of people who like both of these things. So graph search is is really only limited by your imagination. And I use it to, one, create that kind of understanding of 
my audience, but also to have um, a way when I'm doing Facebook advertising to target people who are similar. Um, they like similar things, similar book pages. I can add book pages. I don't have to say all pages. I could say, show me book pages that are liked by people um, with a certain set of, of characteristics. So you can do really targeted advertising in Facebook if you use graph search to understand a bit more about your audience. And then one thing that um, people don't necessarily know is that you can also look at um, any particular page and get a little bit of, um, of data about what their particular audience looks like. So if we click on the like box, um, we get this sort of generic view of um, you know, what kind of demographics um, are, are part of uh, people who like this page. We can scroll over and see, okay, what kind of likes do they get a week? Um, how, does that, how do I compare that to my own page performance? So you can do lots of little competitive research using um, using the graph search. And then, as I mentioned, what you want to do is, um, with your own data, click on the export button. Because um, all of the metrics that you see in that online version of, of Facebook Insights are actually combining fan and non-fan data into those views. So it's really hard to know what are your fans doing. Um, there's dozens of Facebook metrics that you can look at in that web version, but there's hundreds you can look at in the export, which is another reason why you want to export that data. Um, third, there's a lot of metrics in this online version that are largely misunderstood, um, and you really need to dig into the data in the export function. So that's what, that's what I want to show you. Um, let's start with total reach and organic reach. These are two metrics that most people um, track. You see reach numbers under each of your posts. Um, so you go to your Facebook page and then um, each post should show you how many people saw uh, that particular post. And if you hover over it, you get that little black box that will show you organic reach and paid reach. So the problem with these metrics, you might think that total reach is the total number of people who saw this, and organic reach is maybe the number of fans who saw it, paid is the number of um, sort of non-fans or other people who, who saw it um, because you advertised to them. This isn't what it means, funny enough. Um, total reach actually means the total number of people who saw a post, and that can include fans and non-fans. So people who see it in their news feed, um, those are mostly fans, but fans or non-fans can come to your Facebook page. That's tracked as, um, as reach. Maybe someone sees uh, a post in the top right-hand side where you get that little ticker tape of what all your friends are doing. Um, so you're going to see whether content was commented on, shared, or liked by a friend. Um, maybe you see an ad in the right-hand column. So total reach means everyone, fans, friends of fans, and then people who you might advertise to. It's hard to do anything useful with that number because what you really want to know is what number of my fans did I reach and what number of those fans engaged with my post. And you can only get that um, information in the post level data export. So the metric that you're looking for is called uh, lifetime post reached by people who liked your page. Super simple, right? Um, why would you even look for that? But that's, that's the, the metric that's actually going to show you just your fan numbers. So people talking about this, um, this metric is also misleading. It is displayed for every page under the cover image, whether you're an admin of that page or not. Um, and you might think that it means 
the number of people who are sharing, commenting on, or liking your content, but it's actually more than that. Um, it means the number of people who are generating stories about your page during the past week. So that's the first caveat. It's only seven days of data. And it includes comments, likes, and shares of your post, but also any page likes, check-ins, event RSPs, uh, are offer claims, mentions of your page, people writing on your timeline. Um, so it's not a terrible metric to look at, but it's pretty easy to manipulate with ads or um, like getting content or doing any type of campaign that is trying to drive likes. And what you're probably more interested in is the lifetime talking about this on a post-level basis, which again is only available through that post-level export. Um, and then when you export that data, you can actually see a breakdown of comments, likes, and shares. So instead of the on-web on sort of version of that, where it's rolling it all up into one, you can't sort by just which posts have the most comments, or which have the most likes, or which have the most shares. You can certainly do that with the exported data. The, the third thing that is confusing is post clicks. So that insights tab that I showed you um, within the post tab that gives you that quick look at all this data, again, you want to remember that anything in that web version is fan and non-fan engagement. Um, but in addition to that, Facebook has created this metric called post clicks. And it's kind of sneaky because it doesn't mean link clicks. Um, if you're posting uh, status updates on Facebook that include a link and you're interested in how many people are clicking on my Facebook post to come to my website, post clicks is not the metric you're looking for. You want link clicks, and again, you can only find that in the export. Um, what a post click means is the total number of clicks on a post, and that's every type of um, post click that you can imagine. So someone clicking to view the photo or to play a video, if they report the post as spam or they hide it, if you've written a long post and they click to expand it, if they uh, expand to read the comments or they click on a profile within the comment section to, to see who someone else is, all of that is considered a post click. And what you really want is link clicks. You want to know if your fans are clicking through to your website so you have a better understanding of which Facebook posts are generating those visits to your website. And it's a valuable metric, but again, it's only hidden within that post level export. And it's under a tab called consumers um, or consumption. So I've done this little video. I'm hoping the lag isn't too bad. If it if it is, I'm going to post all of these little video walkthroughs um, on a resource page for you at the end. But basically, the export grid that you get, there's a main tab called Key Metrics. And that's where you're going to find that lifetime post reach by fans. Um, and then you've got a bunch of other tabs. And the one you're looking for is the consumers or consumption um, by type. And that's where you're going to find that linked column. It's, it's the same number in, in either um, grid. So <clears throat> if you're maintaining a Facebook page, measuring success is about knowing which of that content is working or not working. And that's dependent on what kind of goals you have in Facebook. So as a publisher, it's important for people to see content on your website, um, whether that's blog content or if you're driving them to book detail pages. So that link um, click is an important metric because it basically helps you track consumption of your content and traffic to your site. Um, I like exporting that post-level data because it gives me that information on what my fans are doing and I can set some time frames for it. So the maximum amount of information you can export at a time is 180 days. I tend to do 150 days or about three months of data. I want to look at um, large pieces of data at a time in order to then get a better idea of um, you know, what, are, what are the most popular posts that people have clicked on and come to my website. 
what kind of um, reach am I getting to just my fans? What kind of fan engagement am I getting? I mentioned on Tuesday as well, I like to use the Google URL builder in order to tag any links that I'm sharing on Facebook that are sending people to my own website. And that way, within Google Analytics, you're able to see, oh, this is Facebook traffic that I sent versus Facebook traffic um, that other people are sending to you. Um, and if you are doing any type of e-commerce or you're running a contest or doing email signups or event registration on your own website and you're also advertising, then I recommend using uh, the conversion pixel. I think most people attended Tuesday's webinar as well where we talked about conversion pixel, so I'll, I'll skip over that now, but um, if we get to the end and you want me to walk through that again, I'm happy to. So what you want to do with your Facebook data is export that post-level data at least quarterly. Um, again, you can only do 180 days worth, so that's why I suggest quarterly. Um, or you know, at least biannually export it and then merge it all together. Have a have a look at at um, at what you've got there, and you're looking really for trends. Um, so you want to analyze things by post type. So start comparing apples to apples of all of my link posts, which is most popular. Of all the photo posts, which ones had the most engagement or most reach. Once you have that data in a spreadsheet, you can run all sorts of reports on it. Um, you can create separate columns, start calculating that ratio of um, fans reached to fans engaged. Um, so that's going to give you a different type of metric. You can do that as ratio, as a percentage. Um, so you can kind of create your own combo metrics that are going to help you determine what content is actually most successful. Um, because you get the breakdown of likes, comments, and shares, maybe you want to just look at you know, what is the most commonly shared type of post, or um, which has negative feedback, people hiding it or reporting it as spam. So we talked on Tuesday about adding some cheese to the broccoli. Um, the negative feedback metrics are going to tell you whether it's too cheesy. And then uh, with the insights, if if you want some other data, there are a couple of tools. Uh, Agora Pulse gives you some benchmark data for your page. Edge Rank Checker uh, is about exposure that your posts have within Facebook. Quintly gives you some free stats on how pages rank in Facebook for a particular category. So those are some other tools that you might be interested in using. So let's move on from content that has influence to people. Um, that are influential. And the same way with Facebook data, that you can, um, it's not just about the number of followers you have, it's about how engaged they are. Same thing with Twitter. As a publisher, you want to build a community of passionate followers who are eager to talk about your stuff, to share it, to retweet it. Um, and you want to find the thought leaders or influencers within your community. We always talk about you know, Twitter is this conversation tool. It's not. It's a broadcast tool. Um, and what you really want to do is find people who have broadcast capabilities. So if they've got, you know, more than 2,000 followers. They have an active Twitter account. They're recommending things. They've got a good ratio of retweets to tweets. Um, so there are a couple of tools that you can use. Um, one is follower. Follower Wonk. It's a good tool for, um, you know, finding influencers within within your followers. They use a metric called social authority. Um, that's going to give you a rank from one to one hundred of all of your followers, and it's based on uh, retweet rate over the last kind of hundred tweets for each follower. It, retweets aren't the be all and end all, um, but you know it's a it's an influence and engagement metric that you get here. And the higher you are in the rank, the more influential that particular follower is. Um, other things you can see on Follower Walk: most active hours for um, your followers, estimates of gender, age, the recency of their tweets. So very similar to some of the the research you can do within Facebook. Another tool is Tweet Reach. 
the important one in that is the contributor section. Um, TweetReach is going to give you your estimated reach and exposure um, for your last 50 tweets. Um, the contributor section is all of the users who contributed most to your reach during a 50 tweet period. So it's a helpful way to gather the names of people who are actually sharing your stuff and are, are, are most important to you for that word of mouth component. Um, what I do with follower walk and tweet reach is I'm looking for people who are influential. They have a high social authority score or they're um, an influential contributor in terms of the reach that my content gets, the exposure of my content. Um, and I start following them. I add them to a Twitter list so I can monitor opportunities uh, to retweet their stuff, to reply to them basically to nurture that relationship the way that you would any publicity relationship. Um, both of those tools, you don't have to use your own uh, Twitter handle. You can do any type of competitor research. Put in your competitor's handle. Um, and most publishers, because your lists are broad, the, what I'd say the goal with Twitter, it's not about building a community of interest around a single topic. So you're unlikely to be just, you know, building Twitter followers who only like um, crafting versus, you know, people who like gardening. You tend to have a bunch of followers who are interested in what you're publishing and they have a wide range of, of interests. So for you, Twitter is really about building bridges with people who are influential within each of those individual communities of interest. So what I would say with Twitter is you want to track your reach numbers, not just your fan numbers, and hunt for those influencers within your community and then start measuring whether your increase in interactions with them, if you can get them resharing your stuff, um, what impact that has on your overall reach and exposure. So of course you're doing that. Um, let's assume you've got an active Twitter follower following, um, you know the influencers and hashtags that are important to you. What we can do is uh, use the Twitter API to export this data into a spreadsheet where we can then work our magic. We can create some dashboard views, we can run other reports. Um, so what we're looking at is a dashboard view of a spreadsheet that I um, used to track tweets that included the hashtag uh, DBW14, so Digital Book World 14. I didn't attend the conference this year, but I was curious about who was tweeting about Digital Book World and what content resonated with them, who were the top tweeters, um, and I wanted to basically set this up once um, and then have the spreadsheet update hourly. So we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. But other ways you could use a tool like this, um, for 40 Night Shelf, I want to know anytime someone tweets and includes a link to 49shelf.com. I just collect that in a grid. It, it does that automatically and then I review it to see things like, oh, maybe I need to do a follow Friday or I want to mention this person or I want to retweet that content. I just want to know anytime someone is sharing 49shelf.com, any URL related to that domain because I might not catch it if I'm just tracking at mentions of 49shelf. Um, other clients, I've got really advanced searches that I'm doing um, with a grid like this. For example, I want to see the top five influencers and only their tweets if they're using a particular keyword. So, for example, if I'm track, um, tracking top financial planners in Canada and I want to know anytime they tweet about the prime lending rate and pull that into a grid. Um, a publisher example, it might be that I want to track an author name or a book title, a campaign hashtag, or anytime someone shares a link to my website in a tweet. So the tool is called Tags, um, and that is, uh, is a fellow, Martin Hoxley, who created this, and Tags stands for Twitter Archive Google Spreadsheet. And it basically pulls in data from Twitter based on whatever search parameters you set up. 
So it could be hashtag, it could be a keyword, it could be links to a domain, um, and then you can add any filters that you want. So show me only tweets from um, these particular users. So to tie these two things together, I can find um, my influencers using follower wonk or tweet reach, and then I can create an archive of the content that they are tweeting about if it contains a particular keyword phrase that I'm interested in. And that's going to compile this nice spreadsheet that lets me see kind of a dashboard view of you know, who's tweeting most often, who's most popular, and I've got access to what the actual tweet was um, if I want to retweet that or or run other reports against it. Um, useful columns, I get the username, the text of the tweet, when it was created, time of day, and the number of followers. So it's another way to kind of start creating a really helpful user um, sort of outreach grid that I can then start thinking about, okay, well, how does that impact if I've only got a certain number of review copies? I kind of check this grid to say, well, who's who's most influential, who's most likely to tweet about this or, or share it um, in other, other social media. So that bit.ly link, bit.ly slash Twitter archiver, um, if you go to that link, Martin has a post and a video tutorial that walks through step by step how to set up the spreadsheet. It's very simple. Um, you just need a Google account and a Twitter API key. He walks you through how to get the Twitter API key. So um, again, it's really simple and I'll just direct you to that link again um, on the resources page. So what we want to do with our Twitter data, um, think about tracking reach, not just your fan numbers. Um, you want to export that quarterly, if not annually, do some competitor research using tools like follower, um, walk, tweet reach to have a look at who's influential, add them to a list, engage with them, run some experiments to see if um, you know getting them more active in terms of retweeting and sharing your stuff if that's helpful to you in terms of your own exposure. Um, you can use that tags tool to monitor particular things, use it for outreach. Um, many people don't know you can access Twitter analytics if you go to analytics.twitter.com um, or you now can advertise on Twitter in Canada. So that's um, new in the last couple of months. It used to be US only. Um, so you now start doing promoted promoted tweets and there's analytics within that as well. It's ads.twitter.com. And same with Facebook, creating that advertising account lets you do some competitor research. Um, creating a Twitter ad account, you don't need to spend anything, but it does give you access to your analytics and you can explore some of the tools there, um, like doing Twitter, Twitter ads that off, off, uh, create an offer. Um, so you can do an offer for, say, a webinar sign up or a coupon code on an ebook. You can do that all within your tweet um, if you're setting up Twitter ads. So it's kind of a cool thing to do. And the Olympics are coming, so we're going to um, own the podium here with Google Analytics. Um, like the tags tool, uh, I like it because of that dashboard view. It lets you get a quick insight into a few pieces of key data. Um, Google custom dashboards let you do that as well. So you can pick whatever metrics are important to you and then view them at a glance. Um, I tend to set it up in three columns. The first, like anything related to acquisition, how people come to my site, I put in the first column. Um, my middle column, I stick to behavior metrics, so what kind of content is resonating with my audience, what search terms are they using to find me, and then the right column I save for um, conversions or consumer data, so it, de it depends if I'm uh, looking at an e-commerce site, then I want all the e-commerce related metrics there like revenue, revenue by campaign, top titles purchased. Um, and if it's a non-e-commerce site, then I like putting in customer data. So what social networks are they coming in? Where do they live? Are they on mobile or not? Um, I have a link in the resources that shows you how to set up these dashboards. Um, and you really you set them up by knowing what metrics you want to measure, so let, let's talk about that. Um, it's important to think through the types of questions that you want answered in the data. 
And so most book-related websites have a home page, a, an about page, book detail pages, and then some trade info. Um, there's probably a search, there's social media links, follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and then some of you have e-commerce. Um, for the most part, the sites are book-centric. So the success of your site is dependent on maximizing the exposure of those book pages. And then looking at the number of times your content is shared on social media, maybe that's blog content or book content, and then any type of conversion. So the number of email subscribers you get or contest entries or e-commerce um, revenue, number of transactions. Maybe if you're not doing e-commerce but you have those buy the book links, so buy on Amazon or Indigo or another retailer of your choice, you want to use event tracking to see well, how many outbound um, clicks am I getting on that. So it, in short, you're tracking macro conversions. So the big goal is sales and then all the micro conversions, the precursors to a sale, things that influence a sale. Um, what I recommend is creating um, basically creating some benchmarks. So I use this kind of model in order to create benchmarks for what success looks like for my website and that's what helps me understand what metrics I should put into that custom dashboard. So this is a model that I use for um, one of my clients. They do about $500,000 annually in revenue and they're selling $50 to $100 items. Um, but they have seasonal sales which kind of makes them a good comp for a publisher site. So what we've done is we've defined our goals. Um, so we need, you know, the purpose of our website is to create awareness of our titles. It's to generate leads. So people with their hand up saying, hey, I'm interested in your stuff. You know, keep me informed through your email newsletter. Or, oh, I'm interested in this. I'm going to look at the detail page for this book. Um, or the almighty conversion, right? I'm going to take an action that is important to you. I'm going to um, sign up or um, buy something or enter a contest. So we create a grid like this in order to kind of structure our thinking about the objectives of our marketing and then we create these KPI, key performance indicator um, columns and, and set some targets. And we do the targets by looking back at, um, you know, a couple seasons of data in order to figure out, well, what, what are the trends? What do, what do the averages look like or what do the spikes look like in order to say, okay, well, my target is to have, you know, 33,000 unique visitors a month. And I know that if I'm running a campaign, it's actually higher than that. It's, you know, 10,000 unique visitors a month. Or if I'm thinking about, you know, what kind of um, exposure are my book pages getting? Well, I know my book detail pages, if I look, you know, season after season, I'm getting about 13,000 page views of that content. So that's going to become my benchmark target. Um, same with, you might have other systems like emails or, um, you know, contest tools that you're using or other places where you're compiling data. So again, I'm going to set targets here of, okay, well, I know I want 200 email signups a month or um, 50 contest entries a week. So you basically want to um, take a step back from your analytics and create a grid that's going to help you think about what is the purpose of your website? What is most important for you to track? So if you get that grid set up, um, I'm going to show you where some of the, the Google Analytics reports and metrics are, are available because analytics just kind of changed the user interface recently and so things are, are hiding in new spots. So that first objective for our site, if it's to create awareness of our titles, um, one of the KPIs, the key performance indicator, is uh, unique visitors. I want to see how many unique visitors are actually seeing my content. There's a new tab called Audience, um, and under the Audience Overview is where you're going to find your unique visitor numbers now. Um, there's also a new set of reports under what's called the Acquisitions tab. It's called Channels, and this is a really great way to see how your traffic um, is coming to the site group by channel. So it's going to pull together all the organic search. So Google, Yahoo, Bing, any other search engine, um, all your paid traffic, all of your uh, social media traffic. So instead of seeing it broken up, here's 
visitors from Facebook, here are my visitors from Twitter, here are my visitors from wherever else. It's going to bundle it together into this um, social media. I find this report um, really handy because in the right hand column um, you can see that there's this little drop down that lets you pick um, either a single goal or all goals. So it helps you kind of um, see which channel is actually generating things that are important to you. So in the case of 49 Shelf, it's member signups. I want to know what channel is actually um, driving the most member signups. And then I can say, okay, well, um, maybe I need to invest more of my time in my email newsletter or more time in social media or more time um, thinking about how to get my contact in indexed in, in search engines better. Um, related to <clears throat> conversions, maybe I want to see all visitors who convert. So anyone who makes a purchase, just show me what those people are doing um, and if they sign up for my newsletter or enter a contest. The way to see that is to use audience segments. It's going to take a subset of your total audience based on whatever parameters you set. So in this case, people who undertake some type of action, they convert. So to see a particular segment or to compare two segments, maybe you want to see mobile traffic versus desktop traffic or people who come to the site from search versus people who come from an email newsletter. You can look at any report um, through this segment audience tool and you find that through this little carrot in the top left. This is something that's new as well. It took me a while. I love custom segments. But I was like, where are they hiding? They're under this little carrot. So if you click on that, it opens this audience segment panel. There are a bunch of preset segments that are in there, um, but you can also create your own segments. Um, so maybe you want things like, show me just my Facebook traffic or uh, heavy users, so people who come frequently, view multiple pages. Um, maybe you want to see mobile visitors. You basically just um, drag that segment into that panel and it's going to uh, create those columns for you. So KPIs related to those book detail pages, um, if you want to see page views just for book pages, you need to have your site structured in a way that allows you to group that content. So with 49 Shelf, the URL is um, 49shelf.com slash books for all the book pages or slash blog for all the blog pages. So if your site isn't structured in that way, um, Google Analytics has a new version of the tracking code, code called Universal Analytics, and that's a really handy. Um, again, basically what you're going to do is if you um, have your site structured in that way or you're using um, the tags, then in the behavior section under all pages report, you can filter that. So you can say, just show me the book content or just show me the blog content. Um, you can do the same thing in any of those reports. So maybe the uh, landing page report, you want to see that. Um, or maybe it, this is sorting it by page views, you could sort by bounce. So show me the top book pages in terms of number of page views, but also that have a high bounce rate. I can try to figure out why. Um, maybe it's missing the, the book description or the image is missing or people are looking for a different version of that book, not this particular format. Um, the conversion column, there's lots of, of great reports under um, this section. Top conversion paths is kind of interesting. It's a handy report that shows how various channels contribute to goal completions. So in most of the other reports, um, you're looking at what's called last attribution. So the channel that people were using um, last. But for example, um, in row four here, we can see that people came to the site initially because of an organic search but then they returned directly. Same thing in row nine, they came because of social media and then they returned directly. So it's telling me people are either searching for something or they're finding, they're following a link on social media, they're remembering it and then they're coming back to my site. 
So most of the other reports are going to say, hey, direct traffic contributed to um, that conversion. But if I'm looking at the path, I can actually get a better understanding of what role things like email or social media are playing in those paths. So I see that it's um, 11.45. I want to leave lots of room for um, questions. So I'm just going to skip ahead to, um, to my slide, my final slide here. Um, what you want to do with that Google data is create some benchmark targets so that you can then create those custom dashboards. So instead of, you know, fussing with Google Analytics and all those various standard reports, you're just going to have a nice little dashboard that takes you at a glance to the key metrics that are important. Um, you definitely want it to, excuse me, I'm going to sneeze. Um, segment your audience and look at those audience segments with standard um, reports or custom reports, custom reports where you set up, I just show me these particular columns. Um, and then I haven't had a chance to show you custom alerts, but I'll, I'll pull that together as a little um, video for you as well because I want to make sure we've got time for questions today. So to sum up, you want to export your Facebook insights so that you see fan-only data. You want to make better decisions about what you post and when in order to get more likes, more engagement, more sales. Um, you want to use Twitter tools to do the same thing, plus find influencers who can amplify your message. And you want to set aside time to figure out the benchmark metrics for your site um, so that you can more efficiently see when um, traffic or conversions are occurring and, and what the reason is for that. So I'll open it up for questions. You have my contact details. Again, you're welcome to use that Twitter hashtag if you've got um, questions that you want to post publicly. And I've compiled a resource page for you um, that has a walkthrough of insights, how to use graph search, that uh, tags tool I mentioned, how to create custom dashboards and set up things like event tracking and goals. All of that stuff is in there. Um, and if you found it helpful, I'm, I'm open to creating either tailored presentations for your organization privately or, or if you have other associations and you want a, a training or a consulting section, um, you're welcome to contact me for that. While we're waiting, why don't I uh, go back to the custom, um, custom alerts that I was going to show you. <clears throat> so custom alerts basically um, you can ask Google Analytics to watch out for specific triggers, like send me an email alert if there is a drop in e-commerce conversions or if I get a big spike in traffic because of a particular campaign. So this is where those benchmarks come in handy. If I know that my uh, target is 10,000 unique visitors a week during a campaign period, I can set up an alert to tell me if I'm above that or, or under that. Um, maybe I want to track email signups um, each month and know, again, if I have a higher or lower than normal conversion. And I can do this um, alert by day, by month, by week. Um, I find it really handy if I'm running a contest. I want to be notified if there's a sudden drop in entries because maybe there's something wrong with the form. So I use it that way as well. Um, the, the general alerts basically... Um, You've got a little detail screen that will show you what the reason for that is. Same thing in custom alerts. Um, anything that you want to set up, you can see a, a little detailed screen that's going to help you dig into the cause. So in this example, I can see the increase as a result of these particular blog pages. And then to create an alert, um, you're going to uh, click New Alert give it a name. Um, the next thing you select there is the period. So um, by day, by week, by month, you can say, hey, send me an email alert when this happens. And then if my uh, goal uh, was uh, blog, blog uh, section of my website, people going to the blog pages, um, the benchmark was 13,000 page views. So I can set up this alert that says, hey, show me um, when page views are greater than 13,000. And then you've got um, 
a way to see a percentage increase or to set that up for any possible metric um, that is of interest to you. Do you use or recommend any external Twitter or social media analytics tools, uh, specifically ones that you would pay for? Um, you know what, I tend to stick to the free tools, but only because it, um, it ra I rack up quite a lot in terms of monthly expenses um, with other, other tools that I'm using. Um, Moz.com, I really like that tool. It's, um, it's about $100 a month that I pay to be able to track what's happening in terms of SEO on several different websites. But it also, they have, um, they've done kind of a package deal, so I get access to Follower Wonk as well. Um, so even though you can use Follower Wonk in order to do some of that Twitter research I showed you, sometimes you're limited in terms of um, if there are a bunch of people using it at a time and you're a free user, you get bumped off or they won't let you run the report. So I use Moz.com in order to get access to Follower Wonk, but I do really like that tool. Um, EdgeRank, uh, oh sorry, I'm looking at the Facebook ones here. Um, the, what other Twitter tools? Social Bro is kind of um, a helpful tool. I would, I would consider paying for that one. Um, and then like TweetReach, it also has a paid version. Um, I, I would consider doing um, Twitter ads, so kind of spending money on Twitter to increase engagement. Um, and that gives you access to the analytics as well. But you can look at just your Twitter analytics for free, analytics.twitter.com. Um, so those are some of the tools that I might pay for. All right, lots of questions rolling in now. Uh, the next one is, uh, you mentioned this on Tuesday about uh, permalinks. Um, this person is just wondering if you could sort of explain why those are useful. Sure. So um, if I'm looking at a blog post, so I'll just go to Boxcar Marketing. Um, if I want to share a link to something that I'm doing on Facebook, so um, say I, I want to post this, hey, last chance to register, um, and this particular blog post is maybe about a contest or a thing that you can do only within Facebook. If I click on the timestamp, I get the permalink for that post. So now I have something, I have the link that I can share on social media that's going to take people right to this post instead of just to my Facebook page and I force them to kind of filter through or find what they're looking for. Um, so I find it helpful if I'm sharing something about a book title. Um, maybe I have some type of ebook offer and I want to um, also drive people to my Facebook page, maybe get them liking my page, then sharing that link on social media is a helpful way to help people discover that content um, if they're not you know, already following you on Facebook. The next question is, uh, on Facebook, how many times a day uh, would you recommend posting? I would recommend posting at least twice a day. Um, <clears throat> the thing, if you have a look, like, Here's, you know, I can see there's this big lump. <laughs> Basically from like 9 until 6 p.m. is when the majority of my traffic is on, on Facebook. And the way that news feed works is it's kind of like a real-time ticker. So people are seeing things that are most recent or things that got a lot of engagement. So if I'm only posting at 9 o'clock and maybe say at 1 or noon, then all of those people who are viewing um, Facebook, their news feed outside of that time are not likely to see my stuff. So what I like to do is, you know, post at least four times a day and I schedule things for that kind of evening period um, as well. And sometimes what I'll do is I'll repost or reword things that I shared earlier in the day because it's unlikely I'm hitting the same audience at both times a day. Um, so I, I do that. I also try to go through in the export level which posts are most popular and I 
mentioned I'm looking at 150 days of data at a time. It's a great way to resurface some of your older content is just, you know, if you, if you don't want to post later in the day something that you posted earlier, try to find some of that archive content that um, was really awesome and repost that. So you can, um, you know, just repost the content directly or reword it, link to it, but basically use that metric information to find what was, what was popular and then schedule that for later in the day. How can you set up a Facebook ads account separate from a personal account? For example, specifically for uh, their company page. Yes. So what you want to do is facebook.com slash ads slash manage. And um, I've already got my account set up here. So you need to go to... I've got a bit of a lag here. Um, settings. Re-enter. It's all very private. Um, in the settings, if you scroll down to the bottom, you can uh, add a user. So you basically, um, you're going to have someone who's the main admin of your Facebook page. So you, you do, in fact, want to make sure that's um, someone who's a more permanent member of your team. Um, you want them to set up the ad account. And then if you are sort of a marketing person or your consultant or something else, then you get them to add you as a user. And that way, um, you, you get access to um, advertise on behalf of that page, but it's not sort of set up as your own, you know, personal credit card. But yeah, it's a bit, um, it's not as, as easy to, to set up and separate just a business account from personal as you would like. Um, and I do have a link on where these settings are as well, so I'll make sure that's on the resource page. The next question is, have you found using a hashtag on, hashtag on Twitter campaigns to be successful, and how would you uh, measure success of a hashtag in a campaign on Twitter? Yeah, so I, um, I, would, I would always use it with this um, tags tool. So success of a hashtag, I mean, I'm interested in how many times it gets reshared or included in someone's tweet. So what I'm doing is setting up my tag spreadsheet and saying the search parameter basically pull in any tweet that is using that particular hashtag. Um, hashtags are much more popular on Twitter than they are on, say, Facebook. Facebook introduced the use of them, but um, people just don't really use it that way on Facebook yet. Um, so in this kind of tags tool, Success for me is going to be, well, how many times was it used in uh, a certain period of time? So over the last seven days or three days, whatever I'm tracking. Um, what did that look like over time? Um, how, you know, who was using that within uh, the last kind of set period of time that I set? Or who were the people who kept reusing it? So if I'm doing something like a cookbook contest and I want people who are sharing a particular recipe tag, then I'm kind of tracking how often that comes up. And the nice thing is that as soon as you set the spreadsheet up, if you um, make it update hourly, you can just kind of leave these things running over time. So for the most, most part, campaign hashtags are successful if they're running um, either in a really intense period, so uh, very intensely over a short period of time, like say Super Bowl ads that have a hashtag, I'm going to track it within kind of a 24-hour period. Um, and if it's sort of a contest that's say a two-week period, then having this sort of run and update over the course of time is, is important. Uh, what consulting packages do you have available for a publisher who might be interested in hiring you to get their analytics on course? <laughs> sure. Um, I have um, I have a section on my website under the services page that um, will give you an idea of some of the things that I do. Um, 
in general for um, monitoring campaigns, so Google Analytics, I have clients who um, sort of pay me a flat rate to give them a report quarterly. So four times a year, I'm, we've talked through creating that benchmark data. I've set up custom reports and analytics for them. Um, they get kind of email notifications however often they would like, and then once a, a quarter we do a closer look, and I run, um, I create a report for them and then also do a recording so that they're able to, to watch that or share it with other team members. Um, so I do that. I do um, half day or um, even one hour kind of private webinars like this. Um, if it's a half day, then it's usually better in person unless you're um, remote, in which case I've done things where I've broken that down into four separate um, little hourly campaigns. We do one one a week. So there's lots of options and um, the services page on Boxcar Marketing is probably the best source for that. 